church. Um, it may be uh, getting colder and rainy outside, but it's warm in here and full of God's love. Uh, isn't that wonderful? I was away last week on a retreat, and um, I heard God, and here is what he said. Amidst the chaos of the world, and I was, I am, and I will forever be with you. And uh, that's how I want to start the service today, because no matter what we're hearing and what we're feeling, God is still with us. I know the governor talked this week, um, I heard that. Um, we are going ahead with our Thanksgiving dinner um, on, uh, on Tuesday. So I hope that you are bringing in your, so still bring in your cookies, bring in your turkeys. See Glenda, I'm sure she could still use some help with some things. Um, we're gonna go ahead with that. And we will see um, how things in our state match up or turn out. Um, we are gonna continue to keep our doors open unless we are um, told not to. Our bishop has put out a letter and he is saying that um, he gives our blessing if we close, he gives blessing if we remain open. I think we've been doing things as best we can to keep people safe, so we will continue to worship in person and over the radio. Welcome to all those who are listening, um, and people can feel free to come or not as they uh, feel safe. Um, continuing in our announcements, um, uh, the radio broadcast today is sponsored by Suda Lucas in loving memory of Reverend Ernest Lucas Sr. And our altar flowers this morning are given by Jennifer and Dane Cutright in honor of Debbie Manson's 70th birthday. She turned 70 on Thursday and her family is wishing this amazing wife mother and grandmother, a wonderful day. And also in honor of Mike and Debbie Manson's 52nd wedding anniversary. All of it's happening this week. What a blessing and example their love and commitment has been for their family and friends. They were here in the first service and it was a delight to see them. So pass on congratulations to them if you see them. So now, um, totally lost, oh yes, our call to worship, we're starting to worship this morning. So up on the screen, if you will, let us say our call to worship from Matthew 6, 19 through 21, responsively. Do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth, where moths and vermin destroy, and where thieves break in and steal. Where moths and vermin do not destroy, and where thieves do not break in and steal together. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. And now we have our hymn, Now Thank We All Our God. You can sing it in your head, you can hum along, you can sing it behind your mask, How, whatever you feel you want to do to worship God and praise His name. Thank mm -hmm. you.
in our joys and praise today. Jim Skinner is home, which is amazing. So we are so thankful that he is home. Kathy Rhodes has moved down to the Manson area and has started her new job and settling into a new home. So please uh, don't forget her. She misses her family here. So um, let's continue to remember her. Those who are grieving, let us remember Joshua Gunn and his family and the loss of his grandfather. And also Becky Milovich, her family. Her daughter was due to be married right around now. And instead, unfortunately, um, her fiance got really sick and they've had to take him off life support. So they will be celebrating a funeral rather than a wedding, how sad that is. So please remember Becky and her whole family in your prayers. Dr. Lee Parks, who um, is, at, or was, uh, passed away this week, and I know he was a much beloved OBGYN in this area. He may have birthed some of you, or helped you birth someone else. Um, so we want to remember he and his family, many people will be missing him. Please continue to remember for healing and in prayer. Devon, that's Jamie Jack's son, um, they rent one of our apartments across by the parking lot over here, um, and he had a seizure um, this week, so remember him. Continue to remember Valerie Ekman, and also um, Helen Prawl, who is now 101, fell and broke her hip, and she is in the hospital, so please continue to remember her and her family. Remember all who are dealing with those who are in hospital, who are in care facilities all around the, the world, not just our state. We keep forgetting this is a world pandemic and we are part of that world. It is just horrendous, is it not? But particularly as um, the nights or the dark is getting longer and longer. This is a time people deal with depression anyway and people facing maybe being closed down again. Um, let us just lift each other up in prayer and don't stop reaching out and touching people with your gifts. Let's go to the Lord in prayer this morning. The oh Lord our God, we come before your throne. We come asking for mercy, for grace, and for peace. Lord, there are so many people who just need to feel your loving touch in their lives, and we are among them. We don't understand this pandemic. We don't like it at all. But Lord, we're in the middle of it. So Lord, give us the grace that we need to reach out to one another. Give us the peace to remember that you are in control of something we have no control over. And Lord, bring your safety and comfort to all those who need you. Those in the hospital, those who are living in care facilities who cannot see their families, those who are, have been so looking forward to holidays and may not be able to get together with families. Lord, be with our schools, with all who work in them and all our students. The stress they are under, Lord, is enormous. And Lord, let us never forget that you have never left us. You are with us forever. You promise that. Let us not lose sight of that promise. Lord, we give to you our very selves. We commit ourselves to you. And on this Consecration Sunday, Lord, we ask that you will be with this church, that you will give us direction for the future, that you will lead us in ways everlasting, and that we can do your will. And now, Lord, we lift up to you the prayer that you taught us as together we say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done 
on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Forever. 
Now he who supplies the seed to the sower and bread for food will also supply and increase your store of seed and will enlarge the harvest of your righteousness. You will be enriched in every way so that you can be generous on every occasion. And through us, your generosity will result in thanksgiving to God. This service that you perform is not only supplying the needs of the Lord's people, but it's also overflowing in many expressions of thanks to God. Because of the service by which you have proved yourselves, others will praise God for the obedience that accompanies your confession of the gospel of Christ and for your generosity in sharing with them and with everyone else. And in their prayers for you, their hearts will go out to you because of the surpassing grace God has given you. Thanks be to God for his indescribable gift. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Amen. You may be seated. God loves a cheerful giver. Let's pray. Oh Lord, you love us always, but you love a cheerful giver. Touch our hearts today and let us this week be cheerful givers in all we do, all we say. Help us to remember that when we are cheerful, we pass on that cheer to others. And there are so many who need that this week. In your name we pray. Amen. This is Consecration Sunday. You know, that Sunday once a year when the preacher stands up before you and talks about money. It's probably my least favorite Sunday of the year. But I'm determined every year to have fun with this because it isn't really about money it is about giving and being cheerful givers did you know that the second most talked about subject that jesus preached about was money amazing huh we might ask why here's two examples in Matthew 15, 8, Jesus said, People honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. Ouch. In Matthew 6, 21, Jesus said, Where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. There's a story of a father who was told he had to take some time, you know, use it or lose it, vacation time. And he decided on this particular Saturday that he wanted to take the whole day and do something special with his son because he loved him so much. So he waited for his son to wake up. And when he came down, he said, son, today is your special day. You and me, the whole day, mom's gone, we're going to do whatever we want. What is the first thing you would like to do? Now, if you were that kid, what would you say? What is the first thing you'd like to do? Now, remember, he was a kid. He remembered that earlier that week, his mom had stopped by to get supper at McDonald's, and they got... Uh, chicken nuggets, not that that's particularly healthy, but she said, you may only have a few fries. We will share a small fry. And it hurt him. He got the nuggets, but only a few fries. That had been on this little boy's mind. And so he said, Dad, I want to go to McDonald's and get some fries. His dad said, okay, let's go. He couldn't believe his luck. They got in the car, and he was in his car seat, and he knew the way. 
And they were, as they were getting closer and closer, I'm sure you can put yourself in that little boy's shoes. He began to think about the French fries. And as he thought about them, he could taste them. All that salt and goodness going into his mouth. Oh, yum. He was even salivating as they stood in line waiting to place their orders. Can you imagine when dad had the tray? And they went to sit down at the table. The boy's look of amazement when not only did he have fries, but dad had supersized them. <laughs> what joy there was in this little boy as he began to eat these fries. They seemed to be never ending. His dad sat there in delight watching the joy of his son. And without really thinking about it, as a parent does, he reached over to pick up a frog. And his son very quickly put his hands over them and shielded his fries and said, Dad, these are mine. Dad paid for the fries. He even supersized them. He did have the power to take away those fries from that son. He also had the power to buy more if he wanted. But Dad realized the point of the trip was to enjoy the celebration of relationship with his son and the unexpected gift that had brought happiness to him. <clears throat> John 3.16 says, For God so loved the world that he gave his Son so that all who believe may have eternal life. God, the Father in this story, blesses us with all we have, all the French fries. And God delights in our happiness because he is a cheerful giver, giving us the example. Sometimes God blesses us with supersizing the blessings. And other times they are just enough. But just like the dad in the story, God is the one who provides all we need and more. God could come and take away all our fries, but that won't happen. You know why? Because God delights in giving and is ecstatic when we finally realize that we can be cheerful givers too, when we learn to share our fries with others. Henry Nowen, one of my favorite authors, said this, to be grateful for the good things that happen in our life is easy, but to be grateful for all of our lives, the good as well as the bad, the moments of joy as well as the moments of sorrow, the successes as well as the failures, the rewards as well as the rejections, that requires hard spiritual work. Let us not be afraid to look at everything that has brought us to where we are now and trust that we will soon see in it the guiding hand of a loving God. The first day of my retreat this week, I read in the morning and in the afternoon, I chose a trail and went out onto the trail and hadn't, been, hadn't walked very far and sat down to read some more and then continue the two and a half mile walk. I'd gone maybe another half mile, so in all maybe a mile of it. And unknown to me, underneath the leaves, there was a root 
that my foot found. And the next thing I know, I eat dirt. I'm on the ground. Instantly I'm concerned about the knee that I had replaced almost two years ago. But it seemed to be fine and I was in one piece. And of course I look around to make sure nobody's seen me trip. They have There was nobody around. I didn't see anyone at all. But then I realized my ankle was hurt. I got up and started to walk and realized very quickly that I could be in trouble. God allowed me to finish the hike because I had to get out of the woods. And then I spent the rest of the week not hiking, but sitting with my foot up and ice on it. Twisted it pretty good. It's, I've got some brilliant colors that I've never ever seen in my life before, all on my ankle. I think it was a lesson for me that God was saying, slow down. I'm here. Pay attention. I've got something I want to tell you. And I was amazed at how easily I could just settle in to not doing, but just doing. What a gift that was. And I want to pass that on to you. In the scripture that we heard today, Paul is writing this letter to the Corinthian church. Now, the Corinthian church could be any of the churches around here today, but of course not our church. Because in the Corinthian church, there were people who complained. Can you believe that? People in church who complained. And Paul was reminding them of many things, but right here in chapter nine, he says, do you remember when I was with you? You made a commitment to help the church in Jerusalem because the church was just getting started. They needed people to come and help teach and preach and do all sorts of things that churches need. And they needed funds to help them build buildings. And the church in Corinth, when Paul was there, said, we will make a commitment to help the church in Jerusalem when you're ready, send word. Paul didn't forget that. Preachers have a way of not forgetting when people make commitments like that. And Paul said, I am reminding you about the commitment that you made for your fellow brothers and sisters in Christ. So I'm sending you this letter and I'm sending men with you who are going to collect your generous offering. But there's no pressure. I want you to consider between you and God what you want to give. All I'm doing is holding you accountable. That's what Consecration Sunday, that's what Commitment Sunday is all about. Paul says, to give, a, when we give of ourselves, God in turn makes us rich in every way. He enlarges our harvest so we have all we need. Give a little, receive a little. Give much, receive much. I have never been able to outgive God. What about you? It's also, Paul says, all about our attitude. When we give freely and generously, Paul says, God loves a cheerful giver. Let's say that together because I want you to remember that. God loves a cheerful giver. So today, I wonder, are you a cheerful giver? In those three areas that we are to give of ourselves, our time, our talent, our treasure. Let's take a few minutes and look at each of those. 
time. Each of us is given 1,440 minutes each day. That sounds like a large number, doesn't it? Boy, I can waste many of those minutes in each day. How about you doing worthless things? We are given 525,600 minutes in a year. How do you spend them? It's how we measure time. It's not how God measures time. But how do you spend those minutes? It's worth thinking about. Do you ever keep a track of them? The first job, excuse me, <clears throat> the first job I had when I moved here to the States was working with an attorney. We had time cards. You ever had to fill out a time card in your work experience? Boy, that's a waste of time. But anyway, I understand that, but still. We had two time cards. Sorry. Sorry, Sorry about that. Two time cards. A billable time card, which is how clients were billed. I understood those. And then none. Non billable time. And he told me, I want you to make sure that at the end of each day, both time cards add up to exactly eight hours. Oh, well, I got to thinking. Excuse me, that means that I have to put down everything I do, every minute of every day. So, Every time I went to the bathroom, I wrote it down on my non-billable list. <laughs> Every time he talked to me, I wrote it down on my non-billable list. I also wrote down filling out time cards on my non-billable list. But it made me think about how we spend our time and how much time I waste on non-essential things. What about you? Think for a moment. If you gave one hour a week to God of your time, just one hour, maybe that's in personal growth, doing a Bible study, or reading the Bible. If you volunteered somewhere for one hour a week and you got paid, thank you Bill, ten dollars an hour. I know that's cheap these days, but it make, it's easier for the math side of things. One hour. You would have amassed a savings or a blessing of five hundred and twenty dollars a year. And that's just one hour. spending your time for God. This last week, God revealed to me a lot about how I spend my time. Some of it good, and a lot of it wasted. So I ended the week by writing a rule of life. I don't know if you've ever done that. I did lots of spiritual practices all leading up to a rule of life. I'm not making it so strict and I know I'm not going to be able to keep it every day. But a rule of life to keep my time that I give to God more efficient. We never know how the time we invest in others God will use to impact his kingdom. Remember that. Are you volunteering this week to help in some way in the, for the Thanksgiving dinner? That is a great use of our time. I know we can't do a lot of things, but what about reaching out to someone, spending a few minutes on the phone? I was talking with a couple of people and how um, people have told me how they are enjoying receiving cards and notes in the mail, as well as phone calls. 
Snail mail is, taking, is becoming popular again. Let us keep in touch with our friends. Talent. What talent do you have? You're not allowed to tell me you don't have a talent because God gives everybody at least one talent. That talent is what makes you the unique person that you are that makes you the person God created you to be. Your abilities, your gifting. Sometimes even just a personality is a gift. Your life experience is a gift you could share with someone. What are your interests? Things that you like to do? How can you use that for God? Your passions, the relationships that you have made, and the networking that you do. Churches need people who know how to network so we can become partners together. Let's quit wasting time reinventing the wheel. How are you using your talents and gifts and abilities for God? Maybe God has put something on your mind that you've had there for a long time, but you've done nothing about it. Maybe now is a time you can be helping to sort out what is a new kind of ministry we could be doing. Even during these times of COVID, maybe I should say especially during these times of COVID. I want to share with you a talent that has been shared and has been used in this house, in this um, church very recently. It's about the Dahlia House. During the fall of 2019, someone had an idea for the use of what had been called the Green Building. The building has served, had been served as the Driven Youth Meeting Place, but now it was sitting empty. The idea was that the building should be used as a women and children's center, a place for temporary shelter, removing them from harm's way on the streets. The name Dahlia House actually appeared in a dream during a Sunday afternoon nap. Peg said that she sat up and just said out loud, Dahlia House. Why a Dahlia? With a little research, she discovered that the meaning of a Dahlia, the colors pink and purple, are associated with kindness and grace, and white is a symbol of staying focused and pure perfect meanings for a place to shelter women and children searching for a new and safe beginning. Following discussions with Pastor Joe, it was agreed this was something that could be pursued, perhaps working with Ross County continued Continuum of Care. Peg and Joe began calling the green building the Dahlia House, and trustees Tom Barnett and Jim Powers were brought into the conversation about the building's use. There was also a vision of a painting of a dahlia, big enough to put on outside the dahlia house. Angie Terry was contracted, and in October of 2019, she began the creation of an eight foot by eight foot pink and white dahlia. The painting took many, many hours to complete as she worked quietly inside the dahlia house, and the result is fan. Fantastic, a true piece of art. While Angie was painting, Peg and the Ross County Continuum of Care were trying to work out the details of Ross County CAO leasing the building and then taking over the responsibility of managing a women and children's shelter. Most of the plan was in place, and then the city said no because of zoning. Although the property is zoned commercial, it does not allow housing for multiple people, even short term. Currently, the Dahlia House is being used to house one individual at a time. We're not letting the city tell us no and not do anything. We assist them getting back on their feet. It is a place where we as a church 
are showing kindness and grace as those living there temporarily focus on taking steps into a new and better future. Perhaps for now, God's plan is for us to touch one life at a time, encouraging, supporting, showing them the love of Christ as they strive to make a change in their life. So for a moment, this is a dream and vision that has now become a reality. Won't you take a moment to thank Angie Turner and all those who have worked so hard on getting this building ready for the painting, which is beautiful on the outside. And if you haven't seen it, take a moment and drive by the green building on the way of leaving church today. Won't you thank those people with me today? <laughs> Together, we can impact the world with our time. Treasure. Growing up, I never heard the word tithe. I didn't know what it meant. It was never a word used in our church or in my family. And it wasn't until my dad's funeral that I heard in the eulogy that the priest gave that I heard my parents were one of the biggest givers in our church. Huh, who knew? I never knew. And I feel that that is such a shame because they could have taught me so much more about giving. I got married and was introduced to the Protestant church and boy did I hear that word tithing always. <laughs> I have learned that all we have belongs to God. And we hear 10% is what we're supposed to give to God. But that's only a guidance because you see us humans are pretty dumb and we need something to guide us. If everything we have is God's, we should really be giving everything back to Him. John Wesley, the founder of the Methodist Church, gave sound advice about tithing. He based it on 1 Timothy 6, 9, which says, those who want to be rich fall into temptation and are trapped by the many senseless and harmful desires that plunge people into ruin and destruction. Is that not the truth? So Wesley taught this about giving. Gain all you can. Save all you can. Give all you can. And here is what he meant. Gain all you can by working hard, earning what you're capable of, without hurting yourselves or others. Saving all you can. Set money aside before spending it on non-essentials. And he gave this advice. If wealthy, he suggested leaving part of your estate to the church or other charity and not to your children, quote, lest they started to gratify themselves. I think about all the times that I've helped my children and the things that I've given them. And really, they should be suffering on their own. I had to. Why shouldn't they? <laughs> but sometimes we give them too much. It's amazing what I've been able to save now I've stopped doing that. Wesley said about giving, the first tenth of what we give to God is the floor, not the ceiling. Early in his ministry, Wesley lived out his thoughts on giving. He earned 30 pounds a year. He gave away two and lived on 28. The next year, his salary doubled and he got 60 pounds. He continued to live on 28 and gave away 32. 
he was writing, and with his book sales, his income increased. But he continued increasingly to give away to others. At the time of death, of his death, he wasn't wealthy. But when people looked at how much he had coming in and what he gave away, he gave away 90% of what he had. Wow. I am nowhere near there. I'm not even sure that I want to set that goal out for myself. But it makes you think about what you give. Our bank statements tell us a lot about how we live out our spiritual life. A reflection maybe of Matthew 6, 21, where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. May I remind you that Paul says, God loves a cheerful giver. In the next week or so, you're going to be getting a letter from the church. A letter that outlines the congregational meeting that we had last week and all the details and where we go from here. And details about another meeting that we're going to have at the beginning of December to take a vote. Also in there will be a commitment card which we're going to ask you to complete, not because you have to, but because you love God. We ask people to make a commitment, not so we know, so much as so we can plan. We can't plan our outreach unless we know what's coming in, right? We do that at home in our budgets. We need to be responsible with church also. So we're asking that you mail your cards back in, or you can bring them to the church, or you can even bring them next week and drop them in the offering plates by the doors. But please return those cards. Giving our time, our time, our treasure, is a reflection of our spiritual faith and love and trust of God. God simply calls us to be faithful to the things he has already given us and to be cheerful with no regrets. So friends, today I want you to think about what are you doing with all the French fries that God has given you? Can you, like the dad in the story, relish your relationship with God because you are a cheerful giver? Or are you obsessed with managing all that God has provided you with? Let us pray. Lord, we want to be cheerful givers. Givers of our time, our talent, our treasure. It all belongs to you, and now we, as stewards of that, have the opportunity to decide what we do with it. Lord, help us to be wise in our decision making. Be with this church and help us be wise and good stewards of all we have and all we do. In your name we pray. Amen. If you would take your communion now, Jesus gave everything, his life, his all, for you and for me. I never tire of hearing that, and I need that reminder every week, how about you? And we see it in the form of communion. We remember that Jesus took the bread, and he said, this is my body broken for you. When you come together, remember me and celebrate and rejoice. And he took the cup and after asking for a blessing from his father above, he said, this is my blood shed for the forgiveness of your sins and for the hope of everlasting life. Let us pray together. O oh Lord our God, pour out your power 
your blessings, your love on these gifts, the cup and the bread. Transform them, Lord, into your body, your blood, so that as we take it, we are transformed from the inside out to help us be more cheerful givers and just better people in love with you. Lord, we thank you for this gift. May it last forever. Amen. Friends, take, eat, and drink.
Thank you for that. A simple thank giving, thanksgiving sung by uh, Brenda Tyson, Shelley Brown, Mel Bethel, Phil Weissander, with, of course, our very own Muriel on uh, violin and Dana on piano. What wonderful music we have here in this church. And uh, I just want to absolutely... I want to thank Muriel for uh, looking beyond. I know we're all missing choir, especially those of you who are in the choir. Um, but uh, what wonderful music, musical renditions we have had in spite of COVID, right? So as you go this week, remember, be a cheerful giver in all you do, in all you say, in all you are. Let us pray together. Lord, as we go out into your world to be Jesus Christ's hands and feet, help us to remember to do so cheerfully. Our attitude means a lot to others. Go before us, behind us, beside us. Lift us up, Lord, and we ask this in the name of God the Father, through his Son, Jesus Christ, and in the power of the Holy Spirit, and all God's people say, Amen.